welcome, Dr. Anthony Beck. Thank you for joining me. Hey, all right. Good to see you, brother. Thanks for having me on here. Yeah, thank you for joining me. I've got so, a nootropic in hand, sipping a little yerba mate. Oh, nice. Yeah, yerba mate is nice, right? It's a lot better than coffee, in my opinion. I agree. You, yeah. you know, coffee's burnt. Mate ain't. Mate gives you all the chlorophyll and minerals, so it's yeah. For sure. So I know that you're all about the, what you call the balance protocol. So can you talk to me a little about what that is? Sure. Uh, so, you know, I, I've been uh, practicing functional medicine a little over 20 years, about uh, 15, 14 years ago. I kind of, uh, after seeing enough patients, I started to recognize, you know, patterns. And I go, well, you know, there's, I can understand where so many people get frustrated getting, uh, you know, advised by different specialists and stuff that are treating their disease and not them in their story. Um, especially, you know, a lot of my, my military, you know, SF guys, they go to the VA and they said, Hey, listen, um, you know, they're just, they, they don't want to hear my story. They just want to, you know, okay, what's your complaint? Let's give it a diagnosis and then give you the, you know, the, the, the pharmacopoeia. Right. So, um, anyhow, I said, you know, there's gotta be a better way. I started thinking, okay, well, but I did see some empirical patterns in people's lives. And so, um, I just, observed a pattern and that was the fact that there are things and a framework that we really should approach uh, things in. So the balance protocol is my protocol you know, for balance. Basically it makes the individual central to the entire narrative, their unique story. So of course it's going to embrace biochemical individuality and genetic uniqueness but as it meets their environment. So I was like okay well how do we quantify the patient and then once we do all that with all that data, how do you proceed? There's got to be a, an order of operations, just like, you know, in the universe, there's all kinds of math, right? There's repeated patterns, both in geometry and, and fractal geometry, and then you've got, you know, numbers and math and physics and stuff. And I'm going, well, hold on a second. There's got to be a framework and order, like math. You know, you got to add and subtract, multiply, divide, in the parentheses, out of the parentheses, above the line, below the line. So you just don't start adding numbers or start throwing things at a, uh, a particular uh, complaint that the patient has. So I was like, okay, well, if I had to distill that down into a framework, what, you know, and, and, and reveal that pattern, it came up with actually, it's, it's odd it, as enough, is a Fibonacci spiral. So it's a two, three, five, eight framework. So balance protocol is you ask the two questions, what do we got to add and what do we have to remove? And then once you figure that out, you are going to actually have to proceed in a, uh, a method that is going to add a synergistic uh, compounding effect. So it's what I call the three phases. So I talk about nourish, balance, purify. Um, a lot of people like to start with purify or detox as the place to start health. And I went, no, you need to nourish the patient first, you know, balance their environment, their inflammation, their hormones, and then detoxify the body. But that's just a sample. Uh, the five stands for the five causes. I found that uh, you can pretty much distill all disease or health complaints down to five um, factors, whether it be nutrient deficiencies, stressors, now stressors isn't just psychological stress, but EMF and sound and all kinds of different things. There's any energetic compound in the environment can create a stressor. Yeah, I want to get more into that with you later. Very good. So, so you've got nutrient deficiencies. We know that a zinc deficiency can create a problem. We know that a folate deficiency can create a problem. A B12 can be a vitamin D. Okay, so we, that, most people grab that one. Stressors. Then the third one would, of course, be microbes. You know, bacteria, fungus, virus, parasites, all these little microbes, we know they can cause disease in them themselves. The fourth thing, of course, are toxins. This is going to be everything from heavy metals to VOCs to, to phthalates and all the stuff, in, you know, that we consume. And then the fifth thing are in allergens. This is lots of tolerance in our environment, right? And it's not just pet dander and, uh, you know, peanuts and things like that, things that most people think are just healthy for everybody could actually be an, an allergen to you, including coconut and avocado and all those lovely fun things. So those are the five causes. So that's the two, three, five, the eight are the eight systems. What I found was is that no matter what the patient presented with, they had downstream effects in all systems biology, right? So we know there's a mind body, you know, connection, right? But then, okay, what of that body? We know that there's a gut brain connection and all the mechanisms that connect that. And generally speaking, some people have some form of inflammation. Well, there's a system in the body that handles that. And then that spins over into hormonal and neurotransmitter disruption. So we have an effect of that. So in other words, I've distilled it down to the eight systems. It kind of covers everything in the body 
the first being the environmental inputs of air, water, light, sound, EMF, and food, which is just funny because they're all technically EMF, but I broke them into categories so we could you know, chunk onto that. The second thing is, of course, the GI and the gut. Everybody says health begins and illness begins in the gut, and I say no, it begins in the, it begins in the environment. So uh, gut and GI is actually number two. Number three is, of course, your mindset, where you're at and how you view your world and your blueprint and stuff like that. It's going to absolutely affect the way that you either heal or, or avert disease. Uh, number four is when we get into uh, inflammation and immune response, those systems. Number five is structural, both at the cellular level and the physical level, you know, when it comes to muscles, sinews, and bones. Uh, then we move on to the energy production or oxidative stress and mitochondrial stuff in the body systems. Then we go on to hormones, neurotransmitters, and then lastly, biotransformation detoxification systems. So those are the eight. So that's the two, three, five, eight of that much protocol. Whew, right? Nice. So that's basically <laughs> it. So it's a framework to navigate all the methods. So I embrace everything all the way from, you know, pharmaceutical medications, using, you know, properly, um, uh, when it comes to things like acupuncture and massage and dietary interventions and, and you know, chelation and, uh, you know, psychedelic substances. I mean, everything is a tool in the box. But the key is to quantify it on the individual patient in yours, not just I'm going to give this to humans because all the studies say that this diet was good. Well, maybe for that sample population, they didn't control for a lot of other things. So it's a framework to cut through all that noise and confusion. So yeah. that's kind of how it goes. Beautiful. So uh, one of the things you said is health doesn't start in the gut. It starts in the environment. Sure. And so we have things like EMFs, air, food, water, uh, circadian rhythm, um, sound, oh, that's things. That's things. What's up? So, yep, yeah, that's all a part of the story. Yeah. It's, it's, so it's what I call the symphony, right? Yeah. So so tell. Let's talk about that because I think that I mean that's a big topic that can probably take up this whole interview, but I think it's oh, it's worthwhile sure. um, to go into some of these things. Like, I mean, let's let's start with. Uh, well, I guess we could start with whatever air, sound, well, light. Well, I kind of go in in that order. Okay. I go air, water, light, sound. Okay electro and magnetic and then you know food right so the thing about it is is air reason why that is is listen most people don't realize at least in the united states well the, the third leading cause of death in the united states are doctors let's just put that there but according to the cdc <laughs> it's it's um pulmonary diseases right the third so you know cardiovascular disease gets a lot of a lot of hype cancer does but number three people forget we have these respiratory diseases yeah so air like gets no Thing, except when we talk about old smog. Very true. Right? So I'm a, I'm a big advocate of that, which is one of the, it, we kind of forget that, you know, you can only, the shortest amount of time that you can go without one of these vital things is air. You, know, you yeah. go a long time without water and food and light and stuff. So we got to get back to how and what we breathe. And so, you know, we're in an industrialized world, right? So we've got all this particulate in there. Um, we have, you know, manufacture and all kinds of, you know, things. Everybody's all... <laughs> about carbon dioxide and what it does, and that's just not true at all. It's actually you know, carbon monoxide and sulfur that are the issues, but CO2 emissions always get sold to thing. But the point is, is there's also you know, radon in certain environments, people who are trying to get back to nature, right? And they're building houses in these little, little houses and stuff like that in the mountains, and they don't know that they could be getting poisoned by radon coming up into their homes, right? And these little houses don't want to have that kind of stuff. From, so from what? What's the source of that? Radon. From where? From from the earth, from the planet. It's, it's higher in mountainous, rocky, shale environments. So if you have oh, you get smoke detectors, you have radon detectors, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of people don't realize that they are getting sick in their house even though they're, quote, unquote, biohacking all these wonderful things. And I'm drinking spring water and I'm, you know, and I'm getting grounded and I don't have any electrical stuff and I'm kind of off the grid and I'm growing my own honeybees. Well, you got this little bitty house, you know, built on this rocky side, you know, and, you know, I always get when I say, well, the dreadlocks don't bounce off radon, right? So <laughs> it's, like, it's like this story. But anyway, so air is a big issue, whether you're in the city or whatever. Um, and then, of course, all the EMFs that are out there, they affect not only us, but the particles out in the air, right? Mm. Um, they have charge, too. And so when you're breathing those in, you're getting that charge into you as well. So, so air is a big part of the narrative. And then, of course, we have different breathing methods out there. And everybody's getting down on the Wim Hof and stuff like that. And 
Um, it's a good therapy, but again, not for everyone. And you can actually create a lot of detriment doing that method if you don't know your starting point. In, so, in, in what way? Well, the thing about it is, is when you are in, in that narrative, and I, I, I really avoid, you know me, really, you know, staying away from any ad hominems, right? But sure. I, I, I talk about things from a, from a scientist. Yeah, point. I mean, we don't have to go after Wim Hof specifically, but let's just talk uh, about like, that, like, that like breath needed. holding training more That's more right. Broadly. So inhaling and exhaling and then, and then holding and then exhaling. Okay. Well, the problem with that is, is the narrative is that it increases oxygen set in the blood, and that's actually not true. You have a, a max limit. If you put a little you know, oxygen sat meter on your finger, you're pretty much going to be at about 97, 98. And okay, you'll go up 2%. Right. The big issue though is, is it tends to make the person devoid of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is extremely important. And matter of fact, it is the rate limiting factor for this um, desire to breathe. It's not the oxygen deprivation. Uh, it's actually the, what's going on with your CO2 level. And when you're holding your breath, you oxygenate a whole bunch and you hold your breath, you'll have a benefit because now what you're doing is, is you're keeping the carbon dioxide inside, which allows oxygen to actually oxygenate. Well, the bottom line here is, is you, you gotta, you gotta realize that you have to have an exchange of those and keep CO2 levels high to it's not all about the oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. um, so anyhow, there's, there's great information out there about the uh, uh, Butinko method and oxygen advantage. And there's, I'm not the only one aware of it. Right. Well, both are applicable. Both are great strategies. You just got to know where you are and which one will be appropriate for you. And then once you leverage it, when to take the exit ramp. Okay. It's static, mm -hmm. right? So it can alter metabolic pathways and how you manufacture energy. This is how we get our different oxidative types and different things and what actually goes on with how we manufacture energy from the macros. Gotcha. Air is a big thing of it. So you got to be mindful of your gases and you can monitor those really easy mm -hmm. um, by certain things like control pause and by, you know, uh, um, clinostatic blood pressure readings, breath hold time, respiratory rate, um, pressure um, when you're laying down versus standing up versus the difference between the two. There's, there's a lot of little biometrics that we can measure that. And it's not something that of course we can talk about. Gotcha. So but yeah, so air is a big part of it and you got to know where you're at in that continuum. Okay. And what about like indoor air environments and things like air purifiers, house plants, things like that? Sure. Well, I love me some plants and that's the, that's the answer to all of it. It's the reason why nature is litmus, right? <laughs> we get everything. When you're when you're out there, you know, sojourning in the um, in the woods, that's that's really it. Well, until they put up stupid towers. But anyway, <laughs> um, the thing is, in your air environment, um, we, we live in a modernized world. I'm here in Florida. It's hot, right? And I'm not going to be hanging out in the house, you know, that's 86 degrees. It just doesn't feel well, right? So we're going to use air conditioning. When you condition air, you now are handling it in a different way. Um, through filters or not filters, there's different, you know, and if you change your, you, your humidity, you get different microbial potentials uh, that can grow or not grow. And all these might, you know, not be detectable, but they're there, they're measurable. Um, real simple little devices that you can, you can check it. But um, so yeah, so with, with, with air conditioning and indoor environments, you're gonna have that uh, happen. You gotta exchange your air. You know, every day I open up windows uh, either in the morning um, and or in the end or in the evening when the with the pressure and the humidity shifts and changes so that helps to mitigate the, the particulate in or out you don't want to really do it you know high noon <laughs> it just you just invite in a whole bunch of particulate gotcha and yeah. as as far as like indoor air pollutants vocs and things like that do you do you have any recommendations on air purifiers or a, oh, do, are you a fan uh, of air purifiers I am. Okay. Well, and, and of course, purifier really kind of is a misnomer, but we'll, we'll go with it. I mean, you're really not going to purify it per se. Um, I have a unit um, uh, called, in, it's made by a company here in Florida called EnviroCleanse, with a K and a Z. And it's the one that I found that does the best. There's all kinds of ones out there, you know, the Shield Defender and all kinds of stuff, the little ionic ones, and then you got Ozone, and there's a whole myriad. And each has their place. But again, you got to quantify your environment and determine which one you might need to fortify with. Mm -hmm. but as a general rule, I use, of course, a HEPA filter. Uh, the filter, the one that I use, has a big old, you know, uh, six-inch thick HEPA filter. And then after that, it has a very special filter that literally captures, neutralizes VOCs. It's one, the only one out there that's actually doing that. So it's mm -hmm. a, it is a uh, 
a, a, a chemical, electrochemical reaction uh, of the medium that's in there. So as that air passes through or those things with typical things wouldn't get, it actually neutralizes them, right? But then you got to come back to some of the other environmental inputs like sound and EMFs, right? So, of course, you want to meter the device that you're using to mitigate your air and make sure you're not producing anything. And with this one, I did, right? So it, it, it passes the balance protocol test. Gotcha. Okay, so what's, what's after air? Water. Okay, so talk to me about water. I know there's a, there's a lot here that we could potentially go into, but um, what, what are the biggies? What are the big problems that people have with water? Yeah, well, the big thing is, is nature, again, is the litmus test, right? And so out there, um, you know, in, in, in our space, um, you and I share that, that space and have a lot of similar uh, listeners, uh, as we talk about Pollock's work and EZ, which is absolutely true. Water is phenomenal. It is, is an amazing substance. And actually, I should, I should probably stop you there because all my like, members in my Energy Blueprint program know mm -hmm. about Gerald Pollack's work. They know about Easy Water. Um, but the other 90% of people who are listening to this podi <laughs> po podcast, right. podcast <laughs> um, have no clue about that. Words yeah. So, yeah, no, I have, uh, that's what happens when you have a little baby. Um, <laughs> now I'm thinking potty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the vernacular changes. It's great. <laughs> so, um, so I guess we should I just go briefly into, into Pollock's work and EZ. So what's that all about for yeah, people well, who have never heard of it? It stands for exclusion zone. And basically, you know, it, it's the term that represents what happens to water as it uh, borders a, you know, uh, 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 your membranes of your body, whether it be your cells or your arteries or capillaries and things like that, things that are, uh, you know, hydrophilic, right? So um, we, we found a very interesting characteristic that as fluids flow that, um, they create on uh, this exclusion zone along their border of a membrane. And in there, that uh, in, in invokes a certain uh, level of properties, right? It excludes things. It creates a charge potential. Um, uh, it changes the viscosity you know, of, of that as it goes. And it actually creates uh, an electrical potential to where it actually, you know, you can actually create charge you know, that the body can uh, really glean that from kind of like a battery there is a positive and a negative zone so the thing is is that when you consume water water or anything for that matter you have to tune it to you see things don't stay foreign once they enter the body the body has to bring it back to our resonance frequency right or you know, what I call it back to which is that's deep thought but because uh, we're all part of the one right but um, the thing is, so when we consume water, what ends up happening is the body has to tune it to us and then impart it with certain properties. There is no necessarily pure water by the, by the definition of, of water. Water doesn't stay just water in the body. I mean, it, as soon as it hits the stomach, it now has water plus gastric you know, molecules. Right, and as it goes into blood, it's it's blood. It's not water. That's why in a recipe you can't, you know, it calls for water. You can't add blood. You can't add milk. You can't add cerebral spinal fluid. It's not water anymore. It's water with other stuff. So, but we need to replace that water as we use that charge and put waste product back into it. It has to be replaced. So, water is a big part of the narrative. And uh, I, I love nature, but man now lives on top of and within nature, and we poop and we pee and we pollute in it. So the adages out there of, oh, just going to, you know, find a spring.com and harvesting spring water, well, that's very romantic. But again, I'm a, I'm a quantify guy. I'm like, you better test that water. <laughs> and, you, and you don't have to do it every day, but periodically, because you, you're under a false presupposition that it's free of stuff yeah. just because it's spring water. Huh? That's, man, I, that's, I've seen a lot of health detriment clinically because of that fallacy. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we can't do that as spring. Um, and then, of course, there's all kind of water systems and people thinking that water's dead or distilled water is dead or this water is dead. There's no such thing as dead water. Um, water always has life. It's just a matter of what its capacity is in its environment. So I'm a huge fan of uh, reverse osmosis filtering systems in the home, which you then remineralize that water and then structure it and then consume it. And so, yeah, well, there's a, there's a lot there. So, yeah. um, I mean, I guess the first part of that, just for people who are unfamiliar, reverse osmosis is removing a lot of uh, pollutants uh, and yeah. potentially harmful compounds from the water, but also potentially removing beneficial minerals. So You got it. Yeah, so when reverse osmosis basically means you're, you are putting water through a pressurized membrane 
that excludes just about everything, right? The vast majority of stuff. Certain little bitty molecules can possibly come through, depends upon the pressure of the system and the quality of the manufacturer, right? So um, the systems that I use, I, I of course test the end product and verify that it gets everything out. So you're gonna have zero total dissolved solids. You're not gonna have any minerals in there, not the bad ones, nor the good ones, or the ones that we need. You're not gonna have, you know, pharmaceutical medications or different fun stuff in there that's, you know, because remember we poop and pee in our water. Everybody has to remember that. That water that you're drinking is not the first time <laughs> that it's ever come in contact with humans. So the thing is, is RO. So reverse osmosis does remove everything, even the beneficial stuff. So for water to work, we want it to be like nature, right? And we want minerals back into it. As water flows uh, over uh, rocks and through the, uh, the Earth's crust and stuff like that, it picks up these minerals and it becomes a part of it, which allows it to you know, become that battery that it is and to do its job, right? Mm -hmm. But then water also um, has movement, right? And so those, you have the water as the base, the minerals as, as the, the charge potential, and then now you actually charge it through, through movement. So that's where structuring comes into play. And there's all kinds of ways to structure water. So uh, real quick, before you go into that, what, so what do you actually use for, to remineralize water? Well, there's a variety of different things. Um, in the system that I have in, in my house, I have an inline cartridge that has uh, some calcium, some potassium, and some magnesium uh, in it. Um, and so as the water passes through that, it slowly dissolves into the water and we consume that mm -hmm. one way. Um, if you are just have an RO system that doesn't have that, you can do it by, there's a variety of different sources out there of uh, sea minerals, trace minerals that they basically make by taking shale and they drip water through it over time and a big old thing, they collect it and it basically it makes a concentrate, you can add that to it. You can add a variety of different salts from around the world, all the way from Celtic to the Himalayan stuff to my favorite, which is uh, Fleur de Sol, which is from France. Uh, it's a gray salt, it's amazing. Um, it doesn't have much uh, sulfur in it, so it doesn't have that funk, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if I wanna add sulfur, um, I'll use uh, Epsom salts which I also do too. So you can grab various salts um, and play with them and make your own spring water, right? Mm. So you can grab different mixtures of baking soda, which is sodium bicarbonate, and then of course magnesium sulfate, and you can grab potassium bicarbonate, and you can grab you know a, a, a whole variety and play with them. Now in the home brewing industry, all this stuff is available because they do that to get the right water to impart the right brew for whatever ingredients they're using. So different combinations of that can actually be added to the water. Sometimes you have to carbonate that water with like a soda stream to so have enough carbonic acid to get the, the, the chemical yeah. reaction. Yeah. Um, but that's it, so you can add it. You can, you can, what I call, just do water amendment. You know, you clear your water out, put minerals back into it, and consume that. And okay. that's really the way to go. There's all kinds of different things. I don't like, you know, anything that's on refrigerators or none of the pitchers, none of that stuff. I mean, there's, there's tons of stuff we can get into, but reverse osmosis really is the way to go. And no, yeah, none, none of the pitcher filters, you're talking about Brita. Not sort of a single yeah. damn one. There's some that'll get you by to pack with you and travel to get you closer to, right? For a, for a week or a few days or something. Right, but as, you know, raising your standard and maintaining that for yourself and your family and what you cook with, we really don't want to do that. Right. It's not like I've ever gone through a not gone through a, an airport and been so parts I, you know, push that little button and had me a little Chicago. You know, I mean, it, it happens. It's not like I'm like, oh, my God, it's like urinal water. But I don't want to consume that to any varying degree. Right. Um, but the thing is, is then you definitely want to stay away from these alkalizers, you know, all the Kagans and the electrical zappers and stuff like that. Oh, good. I'm glad you brought that up. So why is that? I mean, there's, there's water is such a tricky thing because there's so much pseudoscience and misinformation out there. It's hard to sort through it all with alkaline waters, ionizers, all that well, kind of stuff. Based, yeah, it's all based upon a, a false presupposition that we need to have alkaline water. It's not true. Okay. The, the bottom line is, is water is not used to mitigate our pH. The body does it with minerals and pH is different in all kinds of different compartments within the body. Okay. So the thing is, is I was really open to it in the late eighties, early nineties when these things started coming onto play. So, but what I did is I monitored patients metabolics and I can absolutely clinically conclude from, I can't remember how many dozens, I'm more, it's hundreds 
that people have done these units and I've seen their metabolism destroyed. Now, have they had initial benefit at the very beginning? Sure. I can get that. Okay, so it's a therapeutic tool initially. But the problem is people don't know when to take that exit ramp. Same thing like when it comes to cannabis or mushrooms or um, antibiotics, right? In other words, there's all kinds of things that we can use to our benefit, but you got to know when to back away. Right. So I'm not saying they don't do what they do. Okay. You know, what, what about um, hydrogen water? Well, same thing. The body's, that's the quickest thing to do is to lose that as soon as it hits the gut. Same thing with oxygenated water. Mm -hmm. You consume that water, it ain't going to make it through the stomach. It's just not going to. There's going to have a charge war immediately, Yeah. right? It's just, it's just what's going to happen. Um, now, typically when you drink water, if, if it's just water and you don't eat anything with it, it's going to stay, just ask runners, right? We know it's going to stay in there for about 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, mm -hmm. right? Then until gastric empties. If you do it with food, well, then that creates a whole nother symphony, and that's going to be in there for 30 minutes to an hour or so, all right? So the bottom line is, is coming in contact with a, a pH of two highly metabolically active environment, eh, right? And, and how I've tested that clinically is, is I do some live biomarkers. We go ahead and take some baseline vials, right, of urine and blood, and we go ahead and have them dose, just like I do when I do, you know, testing blood sugar reaction to food. So, you know, glycemic index is not the same for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, certain foods will, you know, like I do great with rice. I don't, I don't do great with oats. Two, Interesting. I can take the same amount and my blood sugar is, is adjusted differently, mm -hmm. even though they have very similar uh, glycemic index. Sidebar. So in other words, different foods are going to be different for different folks. So as you put it in and then we test afterwards, we'll see some residual effects. And some of them are not really ideal. So gotcha. the bottom line is, is in order for alkalizers to work, they have to have minerals in them. If you ran distilled water through an alkalizer, nothing would happen. There's nothing to electrocute between the, you know, the titanium and the platinum plates, right? So it spits out an acid stream and an alkaline stream. We're supposed, supposed to drink the alkaline stream. Well, it didn't remove the pollutants. So people will attach that to tap water. And so then now they're getting alkalized tap water that also has a whole bunch of the pollutants that you get from the municipal water supply. So mm -hmm. it's not a filter, right? Yeah. And then you have the charlatans out there. I'm going to go ahead and call these people out. The Adia Clarity people, right? Where it's this ground up, you know, battery acid mica, you know, um, stuff that you put in your water and it supposedly creates an oxidative reaction and, and it purifies the water. And then they tell you then, oh, well, they used to not at first, but then now they'll say, hey, listen, you have to now filter. Well, here's the thing. Just filter. Don't put those heavy metals in crap. <laughs> so, I've, ne I've never heard of what you're talking about. Dude, do some research and your mind will just, you'll just crack up. Oh, really? um, add your clarity. Just okay. sure. That's, water, it's add ya, A-D-Y-A? That's correct. And okay. the waterliberty.com people. Okay. So I, I know. To, but listen, so we're, 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 we're people's health. So, so I have to be aware. Gotcha. So let's get, let's get into water structuring because I we still have a, a bunch I want to try to get into before we got to wrap up. But uh, so tell me about structuring real quick. Okay, so the thing about it is, is water. We know that if if it can um, align itself from a chaotic state or bulk state along a hydrophilic membrane, and we have that exclusion zone, we create this lattice. It can create organizational. Well, we can do that. Well, one of the ways to do it is through, of course, vortexing. Right, just spinning the water, moving it. You know, toroidals and, and vortexes exist everywhere. It's out in space. It's in the ocean. It's in our body. It's in our DNA. Um, it is one of those fractal geometric, you know, fingerprints of what I call divine creation. Right. So that's what happens. So you can move water and energize. You can literally change its state. Now, even farmers have known that for years. Back, you know, being a country boy, you know, we saw they call you know. Um, biodynamic farming they would take water and they would put you know soil in it and they would spin it it would paddle it and just spin it and spin it and spin it and then stop it and then spin it back the other way and it literally changed the nature of the water it actually become more watery right it became more viscous and then that's what we would put on our gardens right biodynamic farming mm -hmm. of course there's some other things of taking you know animal horns and stuffing them with yeah. manure and burying them for a couple of lunar cycles and using that. But I mean, we, we don't want to go with <laughs> biscuits on the audience. Oh, you lost me back. Sorry, man. You started stuffing <laughs> horns and burying them. Oop, okay. But anyway, so water can be structured by moving it, by turning it. There's, there's an energetics there. There's an electromagnetism that aligns the molecules, right? Um, you can do it with mag running it past magnetic fields. 
You can do it through certain uh, electrical fields, right? You can you can hit it actually with electricity. Electricity plug when magnetic field that changes it too. There's all kinds of different ways. So you've got magnetism, electricity, movement, and of course light can do it too. Okay. And now is there now? So are you recommending to to pass it through one of these water structuring devices, like vortexing devices, or there's like a blender type thing that's supposed to vortex yeah, your water and then i mean what about just stirring with a spoon and creating a vortex you, in a cup you know what that's it's actually true it's like one of those little you know little coffee you know make your little foam there's one of those little little dc battery mm -hmm. you do it long enough absolutely okay here's the cool thing it doesn't take long just the very nature of water you don't have to do it um so yeah i definitely recommend a structuring device i make them i've got a little way of doing it um but yeah you can spin it but I don't like things like blenders or those pitchers that do the vortex with the little mineral basket in the bottom. Mm. The reason is, is because what you're doing is, is you're now spinning it over a, a big old motor that is on your power grid, right? So by spinning that power grid and that electric field doing that vortex, you're, in my opinion, looking at what I would see, I have not substantiated this with deeper testing than I would typically do. And because I have other options that are less expensive, I, I haven't even bothered, right? But I know it's really cool to have the little minerals in the water and vortex and oh, it's doing all the things that, you know, Beck is talking about. Well, sitting over, you know, an alternating current, you know, magneto, <laughs> okay? So that field imparts that nature to the water, I'm not a fan, right? So I'd like to do it non-mechanically or distally. So in other words, if you had that motor and it was like maybe turned on to like a, 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 a wire that spun uh, yeah. an agitator, that'd be a cool thing. Mm -hmm. I actually do that in some of my product manufacturer. But anyways, so the key is, is you, you spinning it by doing that, pouring it over um, uh, rocks or different shapes, everything from, you know, you can get you a, a PVC tube and you can put all kinds of things in there ranging from marbles to, to, um, uh, to magnets, to um, different beads with different natures and bacteria in them, and, and uh, even you know crystals. Um, but I, I have a kind of proprietary thing that I'm gonna actually you know talk about in my program, so I'm gonna reveal that on your show. But okay. there are other ways of doing it. But you know, it, it's I really don't feel that people need to buy these expensive six hundred dollar blenders to do it, nor these you know three or four hundred dollar little ones from like Nolte where you pour it over these little gray balls. Right. Um, it, does, it does, but I mean, you gotta be realistic here and go, well, do I really need those? And they break real easy. That's okay. It. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm still, you know, just personally, I'm still kind of uh, reserving conclusions about that just because, I mean, we haven't seen tons of clear science on that. I'm open to the possibility that that sort of physical sure. vortexing has those effects, but I, yeah. I just, I'd love to see a little more science on it. Oh, oh, I agree. I agree. Um, the thing, though, for me is in the absence of science, because that's one thing I absolutely love about you is you're not a cynic. You're, a, I, would, I call it a skeptic. I love people being skeptic. I said, don't believe me just because I seem, you know, convicted and passionate about it. Do the research. Yeah, for be sure. Skeptical, but don't be a cynic. There's some people yeah. that I can see and they're looking to be, in, in, they're just bad energy. Yeah, for sure. Trolls. Yeah, that's um, it. But in nature, it's there. For in sure. other words, if I had to look and be an observer, right, and I had to say, okay, what is it, where is it at, right? But then people say, well, listen, all kinds of people in Africa, they go and they, you know, that nasty stagnated pile, right. they the water, they sip out of it, they're just fine. Yeah. Good damn point. But For sure. it's in the desert and it's brown. I like what it feels like in the mountains and streams and the green and the dew. So. Absolutely. Touche. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Okay, so let's, so that's water. Um, mm -hmm. I know we have there's a lot to potentially get into and we won't have time to cover everything, but let's get into some things that I want to talk to you about some things that most people are not talking about because you okay. talk about some things that are really uncommon for people to get into. Um, one is EMS and, mm -hmm. and one is sound and let's go to sound first because okay. I honestly, I almost never hear someone talk about that. Yeah. And, and there's actually a big body of scientific re research talking about the harmful effects of noise pollution. So it's, it's one, one of these factors that's out there that no one's talking about that actually has a huge impact on our, on our bodies and our health. Right. And if we remember, sound has a frequency. It's a part of the EMF spectrum. It's just down on the low end, right? So the thing about it is, is there's sound from space. 
So there are celestial and black body radiance that actually create sound. So we get all caught up in the particle on the way that which is light, but sound is really super important. Nature, again, being back to that, it has sound, okay? Um, babies, they have all kinds of different sounds that they communicate with. It, it literally elicits a response from us, right? I have, I'm a hungry cry, I have a, I'm wet cry, I stub my toe cry, there's all these different, but it's a cry, right? So it, sound has different elicitations to both the body and the mind, right? So we have uh, different tunings. Now we all use the same scale, you know, if you remember you know, any instrumental stuff, you know, every good boy does mine, right? We all have the same notes, but how you play them together will make a different sound. And not every song that's ever been written has been written, but they all use the exact same notes, okay? But then they play them at different harmonics or tunes, octaves, if you will, so sound is vibrational. It is energy. We can also look to, you know, military apparatus, right, to where they actually have, the, you can actually, you know, crowd control with sound. You pop out these, these pressure waves, right? These are not, uh, you know, uh, we have a difference between transverse and longitudinal, but just know this, sound actually penetrates even through, a, like say, a Faraday cage, right, which we use to mitigate EMS. Well, you're not going to block, you know, uh, a longitudinal, you know, pressure wave as of sound. So you, you can zap somebody with EMF in a cage and you might be able to, but sound's going to get right through. So sound hits the body. That vibration translates into receiving of information by our body's proteins. Those proteins can fold or unfold in response to said stimuli, right? So what ends up happening there is if, if, if that's the case, then let's go back to human nature before we do stuff and you look at different cultures. We like to kind of go back a little bit. Uh, ancient stuff, right? And we see people made certain bowls, you know, the, the, the singing bowls or different stuff yeah. to do certain things. So there are different frequencies out there. You know, you talk about 432 hertz and 528 and there's different um, frequencies that we know when they hit the body that the body responds, right? There's a great video out there of this little ball of water that gets hit by different, you know, harmonics, oh, right? Yeah, that's beautiful. What does it go into? So if it can do that, physically we can observe that in science. It doesn't tell us, okay, what that means, right? It's like if you have an immunoglobulin response, it doesn't tell you if it was helpful or harmful. It just mm -hmm. it was a response. It's up to us to determine what it was. So what is it doing to that? We can at least say, hey, okay, there's something there to be looked at. We also know that sometimes when we want to work out, we choose different music, right? Like I love me some Blake Shelton, but I mean on leg day, it's not going to be enough. I might have to rock a little disturbed, right? <laughs> okay. So the, the bottom line here is, is different frequencies and different tones and overtones elicit a certain response. There's a reason why we know. Now what's interesting is, is sound also translates into light also. All right. And then can, you can, you can, there's a reason why certain lights, like we equate red to a certain thing and blue to a certain thing and you know, yellow to be warming and green to be balancing. Well, just like in that part of the spectrum, you can also find that within sound. There are different tones. Babies and animals are a great place to look and see how they do because they're absent of you know, um, stuff, including what, what the interpretation is. But sound's really important. Um, so in, in today's world, we're trying to better the environment. So we'll say we need alternative stuff to electricity and magnetism and CO2. So let's do, you know, wind power. So there's the air, right? But that wind creates a sound, right? So we actually, you know, whenever you create electricity by moving air, you're actually creating sound. See, it's all the EMF together. So the turning of these wind turbines that are put in everybody's people, they don't realize there's a tone coming off of them. There is a flicker, just like LED bulbs have. These are actually have a certain rotational sound. And this infrasound, low frequency noise, has been absolutely, I mean, the science is amazing. It literally thickening, thickens arterial tissue. Wow. Okay? Um, some really cool stuff, right? So we know that if you sit there and you pound something, boom, 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 it's cool at first, like water torture. I don't know if everything's Chinese, but Chinese water torture. The first time it drops, oh, that's cool. That's waterfall. Stand under a waterfall long enough and tell me if you don't feel terrible. Mm. Right? Da, 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 da. Oh, it's great. Oh, I'm enjoying Okay, stay there for about 30, 40 minutes. And you're like, okay, that ain't cool anymore. And then you're actually beat up, right? But that's physical. Well, right? But the pressure wave of sound can do that too. So you got to be mindful of the decibels uh, in your environment emitted from stuff, even the ones you can't hear. 
right? Because as, as we age, we can't hear it. Babies can hear it. Animals can hear it. So now are, are certain, um, I, I, it's not just purely a matter of the volume of the, the intensity of the sound of the decibels. It's, it's yeah. also the, the frequency, right? Yeah. So like, for example, you know, if, if you sleep on a beach and you're, you're going to sleep with the sound of waves, um, you know, or even maybe a waterfall sound in the distance. Fan, or something. The beach is a fantastic example. That yeah. is a really good one because I feel white. You feel wiped out from the sound of the waves? Absolutely. Really? I, I can tell you a time when I was going to a school of Old Dominion in Norfolk, Virginia. I lived on Virginia Beach on 34th Street. Of course, I got woke up by the cops, but um, <laughs> it's just like, it's like drunk. It's rough. And it wasn't because I was drinking. I mean, I was grounded. All that stuff is great, great fresh air, all that kind of stuff. But those waves, I just felt that the whole day my body had memory. Same thing, I've gone to water parks before. Right? Are, you just, are you sure it's because you weren't actually drunk? No, I'm fine. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good one. No, actually, that's what it was. I was a whole different kind of guy back then. I actually, I didn't, yeah. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't drink. So I gotcha. Um, but the thing was, is uh, yeah, it was just that. But so sound, that's it. Also. Um, so wait, so I, what I was getting at was I, what I was implying is that more natural sounds would likely have more positive effects in the body. But what you're saying is, so it, it, it sounds like what you're saying is any sound is problematic. It can be, okay. right? I wouldn't say it, it is because I'm not going to be a monk, right? So the thing is, is that there are, there is sound that we can hear and that we can't hear. Mm -hmm. If a energetic substance can give benefit, I feel in the duality of it, it can therefore be detrimental if too much is given, mm -hmm. right? So in other words, it's like, okay, fantastic, RO, rebinalized, structured water, but if somebody forces me to consume, you know, six gallons in a day, there'd probably be a problem. Mm -hmm. So the same thing when it comes to, like, say, a, a nice, angelic, you know, uh, low volume, uh, uh, 432, uh, uh, oh, binaural. Well, over, it could be too stimuli. It can be too much. See, we have to remember that the pendulum kind of goes both ways. So uh, the big concern that I have is what we can't hear mm. because it doesn't call us to action. When something is loud, we go, ooh, turn that down, and we eat when we feel it, right? But when you're talking down in the, you know, 10, 20, 60 hertz, you're not hearing shit. Yeah. So, but your body feels it, the action is there. Just because your ears aren't perceiving it doesn't matter, right? I, I so it's you. not a matter of loudness or amplitude. It's a matter of the frequency. Okay. So right? like you can lean up against a door and it might not budge. But if you come back and you go, bam, bam, pretty soon you'll break through. Right. So I think cells are very similar to that. So we got to be mindful of, of sound and know how to look for it. Right. So, uh, you know, I, on, a more, on a more practical level, are we looking for things in our environment that are emitting sound and how, how can we actually use this knowledge around sound to protect ourselves? Well, is the thing I would do is, is anything that's man-made that is, that is powered is going to have sound problems. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. I, I did see a video from on your, on your Facebook recently where you were taking some kind of sound detection device yeah. um, and, and putting it like near a TV that was actually turned off, but still plugged in. You got I think it. it was a TV or maybe some well, other there, device. There, I did several, so I'm not sure which one. But yeah, okay. there's different ones. So the, the listening devices can pick up what we can't hear. Mm -hmm. um, so everything from uh, that air conditioner that's outside, that hum, and we go, oh, it's that white noise helps us go to sleep. But yet it's also, mm. right? And it's if you want to play with it, I tell people there's different tones to test your speakers, okay, on YouTube, plenty of stuff like that. And what you can do is just grab these pure tones and just repeat them. Just listen to them for a while and observe yourself and see if they make you feel better or worse. And oftentimes, you'll bell curve. You'll go, oh, that's kind of cool. And you go, oh, okay, that's enough. And you're like, okay, can you just go turn it on? You create an agitation. Um, so that's fun. I, I love stuff like that, right? Um, so the, the bottom line is, is disconnect is the first one, right? So I use this, what I call my 3D approach to uh, all the EMF uh, component energies, right? So the first thing is to disconnect. Number two is distance. Third D would be duration of exposure, right? Mm. So the first thing is just disconnect it. Don't, be, don't, don't have anything to do with it. You know, the second thing is if you're going to have to be connected, well, make sure that you have distance away from it. 
it, it changes it, right? We have drop off, just like light, just like EMF, just like magnetism. Sound is the same thing, right? But sound can travel a lot damn farther than electrical and anything else. Mm. I mean, in the ocean, we can pop off a wave, man, and sound, and it goes a long, long time, right? Yeah. Um, but anyway, so the, the point there is, is then, of course, we're limiting your duration of exposure, right? Like, okay. not, speaking of Disturbed, I went to one of their concerts one time, and my I was toast for two days after. I, I, I didn't even want to lay my head on my pillow. It was so loud. It was terrible. Yeah. Right? But the flames on stage were cool. But no, so <laughs> that's it. So you just, you got to be mindful of that. Um, most of it, that infrasound, that low frequency noise is going to be coming from uh, uh, man powered stuff. Yeah. Okay. Right? So we got like five more minutes, which okay. is a little bit of a time constraint, but I'll challenge you to uh, wow. see if you can, not, not to wrap up, just to see if you can get into one more topic Okay. Uh, of EMFs. Because this is a controversial area. There's... Sure. There's a there's a lot of people kind of saying, hey, EMFs are something to be worried about. Uh, you know, I, I know you and I both have paid attention to Jack Cruz in the past who, sure. well, we won't get into him so much as a person, but he's said a lot of stuff about EMFs and that's a very big thing for him. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then we also have other kind of forces um, who are saying, well, here's studies showing that it's not an issue at all and doesn't affect us whatsoever. And you're just fear mongering over, you know, nonsense and, you know, whatever. So, um, so what's the deal with EMS? Well, of course, so EMF stands for electromagnetic fields, okay? Uh, forces or frequencies, all of them are correct, okay? So we have the electrical side, we have the magnetic side, right? Um, and then we actually have what I call the light side, okay? Which is gonna be like, you know, microwaves. Remember, because, you know, we go through all the spectrum and then we get into, you know, near, mid, far, and then we get into, you know, microwave areas. Okay. So, remember, it's all the same spectrum. But the point is, is here, okay, it is energy. And energy is always information. My favorite quote of myself, right? So, energy is always <laughs> information. It tells the body to do something. We transmit data over radio waves. We transmit data over microwaves. We transmit data over light waves. We transmit data over sound waves, right? Okay, so it's information. So if those are in fact information and it hits the body, it's informing the body. So that's my top litmus test is does it affect us? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What affect, not, we, yeah, there, that can be argued. Now, the data is huge out there when it comes to EMFs. But again, most of the attention goes to the EMF. There's three basic, three, three major ones, electrical, magnetic, and radio frequency. So the RF, the microwaves, the communications, the cell phones, all that kind of, normally gets most of the attention these days. That's, that's the cool thing, you know, Wi-Fi and our routers and stuff like that. Well, there's different frequencies, right? All the way from hertz to megahertz to gigahertz to terahertz. That's how, that's their frequency, right? So they are vibrational. And here you got to understand, when something vibrates, it also produces sound. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So you can, you can hit a protein, make it vibrate from light, and it can make a sound. Pretty crazy. So that's why they're irrevocable. So that we got to look deeper than what we're looking at, okay? Mm -hmm. So I absolutely know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, okay, that EMFs over a certain time in certain symphonies of that unique person can and do create physiological aberrations. Mm -hmm. Make no mistake about it, okay? Yeah. It disrupts things, why? Because they can also hit minerals, right? And what magnesium is doing, what iron is doing, what calcium is doing, and as those move through membranes, it changes <laughs> what the body's actually doing. There is a response to that. So again, we wanna disconnect from most of them as possibly as we can. If we can't, get distance, right? And if, if not, limit your exposure. You and I are on an EMF bomb right now, right? We're getting we're getting light, we're getting sound, we're getting electricity, we're really getting magnetism, and hopefully you're on a wired connection. But, uh, but the thing is, is I'm you glad you brought that up. That was one of the questions I was going to ask. You. Right. So what ends up happening is, is you, you you have all these instruments playing the same notes. There's a there's a different instance in the music, right? When you bring in the percussion and the woodwinds and the brass, right? And you play them all together, the same sound, like say the Star Wars, you know, anthem. So something like that, it's gonna it's gonna sound different than if just say a saxophone played it. So when you it's it's also the culmination of all of them. And science, quote unquote, 
tends to really pick one thing, right? We do the hypothesis and we try to, you know, gather data and observe and that kind of stuff. But what we need, what we do is, okay, we're going to take men ages 24 to 35 who have none of this history and are seemingly healthy. Well, that doesn't tell you how much time they're on, on their phones. It doesn't tell you how much time they're sleeping. It doesn't tell you if they're in California or Aruba, right? There's all kinds of confounding variables that screw up the science to observe if and or these things are doing something. Mm -hmm. So it all comes down to you got to do yourself. It's that N equals one. You know, I, I don't need science to tell me what I can observe in my own self and come to my own conclusions. But I know a lot of people like to go on other people's science. I do too. I mean, I, I don't poo-poo it. My God, I got a freaking library of shit. It's unbelievable. Yeah. But the key here is, is electromagnetic fields are difficult. And believe it or not, even though RF gets a lot of stuff, I'm going to tell you that magnetic fields are far more detrimental. And where are we getting magnetic field? Experience? Anywhere electricity flows. When electricity flows, magne magnetics goes. Okay. So when you ha you can have a, a power cord, and you're not pulling. If you don't turn the light on, they're not going to have a magnetic field. You turn the thing on, start using the power, it'll push out a magnetic field. Mm -hmm. Okay. So magnetic fields are extremely powerful, <clears throat> and they really disrupt stuff like a champ. That's a medical term, by the way, like a champ. So the thing is, is uh, and it's not like one is better than the other. It's like, okay, you know, a Great Dane pooped on my carpet versus, you know, a, a Labrador versus, you know, a, a, you know a, a Yorkie. It's still dog poop. So don't, yeah. I, I'm not trying to say that one is really worse than the other. They all suck. We don't want them. But some take more work to clean up. Okay. If, if they're like, what are the top three issues in this area? So one, you, you mentioned wired internet connection as opposed to Wi-Fi. So yep. that's and one that of them. What, are, yeah. what was what was that? Again, that keeps growing. You keep getting stronger and stronger, you know, routers that push out through deep, deeper into houses and things like that to give a big one, right? Mm -hmm. But then it's not just yours. It's your neighbors and everybody else's. You know, just look at all the networks you can choose from. Yeah. So science, when it tests that, that RF, it's not controlling for that, well, one person's effect might be in a, in a, in a, a building you know, and you have 30 neighbors all with their own Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> it a bit, so we, so we got to be real with that. So that's the one big thing is, of course, the Internet, which allows you and I to be together right now, right, sharing this love. So, again, wire it. Don't put it through, through, through a hardwired connection, through an Ethernet cable, not through uh, the air. Okay, because to get to you, it also, to get your computer and receive it, it also hits all the particles that we're breathing too. So that's okay. one thing. I, um, now, are, can, are there, like, maybe two other quick tips, like practical tips that you can give somebody as far as limiting EMF exposure? Your, your cell phone. That's the one that everybody owns now and we have on us. If you're not using it, have it off. Okay. Airplane mode is a good option, but of course, you know, the battery is still on. That magnetics is still there, mm -hmm. close to the body in your pocket. If you're going to have it on your body, on airplane mode, put it in a shielded case. But for the most part, if you're not using it, turn it off, you will be okay. The world does not come to an end. You don't need constant dopamine hits by taking a look at your Facebook and your email. So okay. turn the damn thing off. Once an hour, come up to Periscope Depth, turn the damn thing on, check and see if the world didn't explode, turn it back off, and then <laughs> back on with your life. So that's the other big tip, right? So yeah. the Wi-Fi thing is, is it. But I, I can't not say that same thing in your house too, right? And this is where I'll leave it. On the electrical and the magnetic side, your home is where you sleep right? You got to turn stuff off. You better figure out what your body voltage is when you're sleeping and what magnetic fields you are when you are in that true on, you know, circadian rhythm, you know, anabolic period of the day where you're paying off all the debt from having your control burns during the day. Yeah. So the best thing I can tell you there is find out what circuits get send energetic power to your bedroom and go to the circuit breaker and turn the damn thing off. Just okay. Like lock the front door, lock the back door, put your, you put your cell phone, turn it off, you know, kiss your wife, make love, run one off, whatever you got to do, and then go flip off the breakers. It's all part of, you know, the entering your sleep sanctuary, cold, dark, quiet, and shut the damn power off. Beautiful. So on that note, we'll, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Anthony. Thanks, I really appreciate your time. And, uh, you know, I know there's a lot more to talk about, so maybe we'll have to have you on for a second time. Anytime, anytime. I'm, cool, I'm, I'm at your disposal. Awesome. Thanks so much, man. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, bro. Hey there, this is Ari Witten with the Energy Blueprint. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And I assume you did, otherwise you probably wouldn't have stuck around this long. 
So in that case, I want to make sure that you go over to the energyblueprint.com and enter your name and email address so that you're on our email list and you get all the latest and greatest information as we release it. The energyblueprint.com is the number one source for information on the science of overcoming fatigue and enhancing your energy levels. So make sure you head on over to the energyblueprint.com, enter your name and email address, or just your email address, and sign up for our email newsletter where you'll get all the latest information, all the latest podcasts, all the latest articles and videos as we release them on the subject of increasing your energy levels. Thank you for watching and I'll see you soon.